A Dream of Fire. One of my spiritual practices is to review my dreams. I usually do this as soon as I come out of the dream into waking consciousness as it's much easier to retrieve them then. I focus on the feeling of the dream. This is a subconscious or unconscious energy that is coming to the surface to be released through the energy of the dream. I then clear the energy by noticing it. Sometimes dreams can be so intense that they arrest your attention for hours or even days. I had one of those a few days ago that still has me digging into all the feelings that cascaded through the dream into my waking consciousness. This was an apocalyptic dream of fire. I was watching TV and an emergency announcement came on that the atmosphere had been ignited and that it was just a matter of a few minutes before the entire atmosphere of the planet would catch fire. I ran outside in time to see a huge rolling wall of fire descending across a peaceful panorama of a country landscape. I watched as the sky above me burst into flame and realized my body death was imminent as I automatically held my breath in anticipation of being instantly fried. Then, oddly, everything burst into flame around me. Trees, grass, houses, barns, fences, even a pond went up in flames, and yet I was unscathed. The fire left as rapidly as it had began, leaving a disturbing view of burned-out devastation. I felt huge relief, yet huge loss, and yet great hope. Then it dawned on me that I had caused the atmosphere to ignite. I became desperate to find other people to see if they too had escaped a certain fiery death. I walked for a little while and saw a small group of people huddled together. They seemed unharmed, and I asked them if they were okay. They nodded. Then I woke up. Once I processed through the emotions creating the dream, I started to zoom out for a greater awareness of my experience of my whole life. I realized that I had been asking for big changes for several days before the dream, and that desire got translated into a destruction dream, revealing my own resistance to the, quote, big change, end quote, I was desiring. It was as though big change was getting interpreted in my subconscious as an apocalypse. I used to have a debate with my next door neighbor who was a former Black Panther. He would echo the teachings of Malcolm X. Social change only happens from violent revolution, he would insist. Indeed, a cursory view of history will certainly provide several examples where this is true. And yet I would argue that a peaceful and persistent campaign to win over the minds of the public was a superior way to create social change. My Black Panther neighbor was never convinced. But that was back in the days before the internet, fake news, and political propaganda on 1,000 channels. I think my neighbor would probably change his tune these days as far as nonviolent social change, but we'd probably agree that using such methods for the creation of an overall utopia for humanity because there was no immediate profit in it for the propagandists, would be highly unlikely. Well, uh, national and world politics aside, I zoomed in on my own personal politics of change and realized that usually, if an unwanted condition or situation arises, I first ask for it to change. Then if it doesn't, I look for subconscious feelings that may be holding the condition in place and let go of those. If things persist, I start looking for what reward I'm getting out of holding the condition in place. Then failing that, I ask, what if this is about something completely different than what I think it is? That usually starts to create a chink in the fixed condition allowing some cracks and eventually the whole thing falls apart in the face of full awareness. I always get back to the concepts of resistance versus allowance. Resistance to an unwanted condition inevitably gives it energy and further attaches it to my energy field. With allowance, the unwanted condition simply floats on by and fades off in the distance. Yet, we tend to resist what we have a vested interest in continuing. We take up arms in the defense of our resistance as if our perceived superior position will cause the, quote, other side, end quote, to just give up, and it's one more victory for the ego. The ego thrives on polarities. And so when we're in resistance to anything, it's pretty much guaranteed it's an ego trip. 
The ego uses the mind to justify, accuse, excuse, and all the other tricks to make us feel right because the other thing is so wrong. Feeling right is a false flag operation. It looks genuine or righteous, but only serves to preserve the unwanted condition, meanwhile soaking up and distracting all the attention you could be spending on creating greater awareness. When we find ourselves in a polarity, immersed in judgments, justifications, and accusations, it's time to seriously check ourselves. Move beyond the polarity into a space of non-judgment where both sides appear perfect for existing. Send love and understanding and notice what part we're all playing in maintaining the conflict. We can then no longer feed energy to the polarity. By employing this technique, we can avoid having to set the planet's atmosphere on fire. You have been listening to This Quantum Life by Boyd Martin. Brought to you by the Quantum Health Newsletter from Pure Energy RX. www.pureenergyrx.com